Today's Pokemon is taking a break from the distortion world to throw its hat into the ring to see if it can compete with the best of the best. So let us see how Giratina does in a Pokemon Red solo challenge. Now this one is a bit of a continuation of the Dialga Palkia versus video. So you might want to go back and watch that because I will talk some spoilers about that video. But there's a reason it wasn't a three-way race outside of the fact that I just don't have that kind of time. Now on paper, there are three main reasons that I thought Giratina just couldn't compete with the other two and I'm gonna hold off on that tangent for now but let's cover the basics first we went the opposite route of Dialga Palkia and we're actually gonna use the origin form today and I know I'm not gonna be showing a side-by-side -side comparison but when you look at the altered versus origin form when you look at the Chansey rule the only difference is that altered has 20 higher defense while origin has 20 extra attack and I'm gonna take the extra attack 10 out of 10 times baby for the learn set I went with a gen 6 learn set just like the other two and you're gonna see very similar things like that Dragon Breath Start, level 15 Slash, Dragon Claw level 28, but Garatina adds in some ghost moves like Ominous Wind early, along with things like Shadow Claw and Shadow Force later, and we'll talk about those in time. I also changed Rock Throw's stats to match Ancient Power because I'm really lazy. I generally limit myself to five moves, and I just could not make this ROM in good faith without adding Shadow Force. TMs are also what you would expect. I did give Garatina a little bit of leeway here with access to things like Ice Beam and Mega Drain because it does learn other ice and grass moves and we're already kind of suspending our disbelief a little bit for these fun runs and I just really believe that in some alternate reality where this is a Gen 1 Pokemon it would get those moves. But let's not linger too much on the early game. It's pretty much like all great runs. I only fight the mandatory bug catcher and then it's straight to Brock. Giratina's Brock fight is exactly like Dialga with one exception. I can three shot each of Brock's Pokemon, but it's a range. Now this is one of those points where I was willing just to reset the entire run because the time investment is so minimal, but believe it or not, you can actually get knocked out here a lot. You don't outspeed the Onyx, sometimes it can take four hits to knock it out, and if Onyx uses a turn one bide and you don't get a three hit, you're done for, and even if it uses a turn two bide that only lasts two turns, it can still retaliate, knock you out. So it's it's not really great, but it's not like you need extreme luck here. I'm just saying that there was some nuance already this early in this run, and I'll touch on that a little bit, but for now, we can celebrate the first badge. Earlier I brought up reasons I didn't think Garatina could compete, and we just seen the first happen right before our eyes. It's really subtle this early in the game, but the Brock fight is kind of like a microcosm for the many parts of the game. I simply do not have the ranges that the 150 special gave Dialga and Palkia. 120 special, it's not bad by any stretch of the imagination, that's not what I'm saying, but I just want you to know that Garatina will bleed some turns and lose some time compared to its other Gen 4 legendary counterparts. And that's just reason one of three. We're gonna eventually circle back around to the other two towards the end of the video. But during this section, there's no extra battles. I did buy an escape rope so that I can skip the rare candy inside of Mount Moon. And I think we can just go straight to Misty. There's one key thing I haven't brought up in a while, and that's Psychic being immune to ghost damage in Gen 1. It's a bug, and it's not one of those like little fun, unintended things like the badge boost glitch. Ghost was just added late in development, and some dude just put a wrong value, and the long and short of what I'm trying to say is that this is one of the very few things that I fix on my ROMs, and what it equates to is that Ominous Wind puts work here on Starmie. Even without the ghost damage, I still resist either move, and in the case of Tackle, I'm just straight up immune to it. So it's a a pretty great source of experience to catch up and I'm also going to hit level 15 at the end which means I get access to slash. Jumping into rival number two, there's some minor sand attack risk here because you can't get a one shot range unless you crit on a rock throw, but everything's basically gonna be a two shot on Pidgeotto. We don't see a sand attack here, but that just means I can just clean up the rest of the fight. It's pretty easy. We can just kind of skim through this one because I got more important things to talk about. 
As you may or may not know, Nugget Bridge and the Path to Bill's House, it is the single highest concentration of back-to-back -back mandatory battles in the entire game. Some would even call it a cluster. Getting through this part fast is paramount to any good run, and luckily Garatina it makes it look easy. But there are a couple of things that I would like to touch on Garatina. First up is the topping. I praise Dialga's steel topping because it resisted normal damage, and whether you realize it or not, the vast majority of this game is just made up of normal damage. So when you're just straight up immune to it, it makes Ghost such a good topping for this game. Now when you couple that with the dragon topping, it has elemental resistances along with Garatina's high base HP, and you have a pretty big defensive monster on your hands. I do have gripes with this top combination, but that's something we'll come back to later, but for the vast majority of this game, this is an S plus top combination. I don't even use S plus, but you get what I'm saying. Now the second little tangent here is the learn set. Now you can't see my fingers, but I'm almost touching them together and I was this close to pulling the trigger on the very first Legends Arceus inspired set and I think it's such a missed opportunity. It was so close to making Garatina potentially one of the best Pokemon we've ever seen and that's for one reason and one reason alone. You get Shadow Claw at level 19, it gets stabbed, it's a high crit move and I think getting that move early would have potential to break the game open kind of like Mega Mewtwo Y did but there are some problems with it. Number one is the absurd amount of normal tops in the game where you simply couldn't even use the move and it just made that level 19 power spike lose a lot of momentum and number two is what you actually give up to get that the only thing that you get to damage normal tops with that set is ancient power it only has five power points and that's just not gonna get you very far the dragon breath start is so pivotal to deal with brock really easy and special damage in general is just so much better overall in a gen 1 playthrough over physical damage in my opinion starting off with only physical ghost moves with ancient power or depleting your power points being the only way to deal damage to ghost types for a while it just didn't yield the best results as you might have guessed but i wanted it to work really bad and while i have you here i'm trying to hit 20k subs so if this is your style of content maybe you like vanilla gen 1 2 or 3 playthroughs then go ahead and hit that button help me out if you want to take it a step further i do offer patch files for cross-gen runs like this for channel members and patreons but either way any support is appreciated and let's move on moving down to the SSN is a bare minimum straight line path to rival number three and this is essentially the same fight as rival two my memory escapes me right now at the moment but I'm pretty sure rock throw being weaker than power gym on the other runs means that once again I can't get a one shot on Pidgeotto now you can see that slash almost does the job but it's just a little bit off but I think you already know how the rest is gonna play out Lieutenant Surge is also a really simple battle. I just slash my way through it, and even if I get really unlucky with a Thunderbolt Paralysis like happens here in the footage, there's just really no win condition for Lieutenant Surge unless I skipped like 14 turns straight, but this one, it's a done deal. This will take us into the first split data of the run, and I want to get Dialga's time today because honestly Palkia's run just isn't realistic for any Pokemon to go against. But remember that Dialga's run was still like an hour and 49 minutes, but you can see what it looks like right here. The Brock split wasn't too far off, only 4 seconds, but I talked about that lower special early, and as the run progressed and I started missing some ranges and taking extra turns, it leads to the numbers here. We got 4 seconds into 43 seconds, and it keeps going up all the way to a minute and 10 second deficit, and it doesn't look great, but all I ask is that you don't count Garatina out just yet. And I'm going to touch on something real quick that I finally got around to, that you may or may not have noticed that I'm using Pokemon Crystal Sprites for this run. I used to use the color patch, then a few people copied it and I stopped using it, and then I went into my own custom stuff, but it didn't translate well. If you just copy and paste those sprites and put them in the game, it just didn't work. Because if you didn't know, every Pokemon has its own individual palette in Gen 2, whereas in Gen 1, the entire game pretty much runs off of like a dozen palettes, so you get a lot of weird looking sprites. So I finally took the time, I touched up every single sprite, I even added my own touches to some of them, and if you don't mind, I'm going to point out a few that I really enjoy. Now if you're like a stinky little purist, snubbing your nose at this, you probably hate the idea of cross-gen runs in general, so just close your eyes, but for the rest of you, tell me if you spot any interesting ones. First up is the Rapping Junior Trainer, and I want to focus on Bellsprout, I don't even care about the fight. Rather than the three decade old outdated green palette, we finally get something that actually looks like Bellsprout 
sprout. I really like this sprout a lot. It's not my favorite, but just soak it in. Let's get back to the run. And this is kind of like a small little morsel where Garatina starts to break free from the other two routes and starts making some decisions to play into its strengths. And it starts by not learning Thunderbolt early. Now, realistically, the only spot an early Thunderbolt helps out before you get to the late game battles is for the slow pokes here in Rock Tunnel. But I'm going to be hanging on to Ominous Wind for reasons that we'll talk about soon. But this move also doubles as a way to still one shot the slow poke so I don't have to lose anything for it. In Celadon, I do an immediate shot by. I cut out all the fat. You can see this girl sitting here trying to block my way for about 35 seconds, but eventually I do pick up and learn Ice Beam. And now let's blitz through the next few segments. The Rocket Hideout is up first. Since we already did the shopping for the run, I'm not picking up anything extra. And even without Ice Beam, I'd still be fine here because I would learn Dragon Claw and it would do the job just fine. But overall, it's a pretty easy section. I decided to take on Pokemon Tower next to get some levels, but the problem in routing was that I cannot one-shot the Gastlys because I don't have 150 special. And you already know if you can't one-shot the Gastlys, now there's potential to be confused, you start losing some turns, taking some damage, and you never know what's going to happen. But keeping Ominous Win here lets me get a guaranteed one-shot in this section. It lets me pick up a little extra time, a little bit more experience, because honestly in this part of the game we just don't have the best ranges. Erica's a big spot where I wanted some extra levels and experience, but first, Victory Bell Sprite. I'm biased because yellow is my favorite color, but I think this one looks pretty great. Back to the fight, I just didn't have the best Ice Beam ranges, and with Garatina's typing, I am at risk to be put to sleep, so that would waste a lot of time. So I just wanted to be like a little bit safer here. And at the end of the fight, Vile Plume is also a custom sprite that I had to do a good bit of custom work on. It's not my favorite, I don't love it, but this is one of those sprites where the straight up conversion to Gen 1 just didn't work. That's another badge. Now we're slowly going to start to ramp up some of those major route differences and first up I'm going to actually catch the Snorlax to replace the Lapras that you would normally get in Sylph and that's so I can use HMs a little bit earlier and after a quick dip into the Safari Zone I'm headed to Koga's Gym. After the very first mandatory Psychic Trainer I'm going to hit level 33 that gets me access to Earthquake. It'll really simplify the next gym and I'm going to use two rare candies here to hit that next damage rounding threshold and it's going to smooth things over. And when talking about Koga I have Earthquake. Earthquake. That's really all you need to know. I can't straight up one shot the evolved Pokemon unless I get a crit, but the potential threats that usually linger in this gym, like an X attack into a self destruct, is nullified by the ghost typing, so it's really safe. And that's really about all I have to say about this one. Now I can dip my toes in the water. We can just relax, just sit back and relax a little bit. We can take that brisk swim down to Cinnabar. Now coming here before you're at least level 42 or so is a risk because of wild encounters. If you didn't know, repels only work up to your level so you can just get really unlucky here and lose a lot of time. I do see one encounter, which isn't too bad all things considered, but I'm actually gonna do something you don't really see often in these runs. I'm gonna pick up a singular vitamin and this lone Carbos helps me in a handful of places that I'll call out if I remember it, but it really smooths some things over. I'm also not going to get Blizzard because it doesn't really help me gain any ranges that Ice Beam can't already handle, and the only question left after that is if TM28 is actually Doomstoner, brother, or not, but let's take a look at Blaine. Here the first part's not too interesting. I made sure to save enough Earthquake PP from earlier to last through this fight, and the first two Pokemon or whatever, they go down in a single hit, but after that are where some cool little details came together that I like to see. This is the first spot where the one Carbos lets me outspeed Rapidash. It's not really too threatening on its own, but if it outspeeds you, technically it could fire spin lock you until you have to reset or waste a lot of time. So it makes things a little bit better, but then I'm gonna level up at the end, and I'm gonna hit another perfect break point to where I outspeed Arcanine by one point as well. Like in the grand scheme of things it really doesn't matter too much but it's kind of like watching two little puzzle pieces slide perfectly together and I think that's just satisfying to me. Heading into Sylph, I'm going to skip the 10th floor. I'm getting straight down to business, beeline straight to rival number 5, so let's talk about it. There's no need for a fancy intro today, and I did finally learn Thunderbolt in the learn set, but the other two Pokemon, Dialga and Palkia, they easily did this fight at level 35. Now we have extra levels here, and we're actually going to hit level 38 during the course of the fight, so everything's mostly a one-shot, and this is more of like a cleanup job rather than a tough fight. But the interesting thing to me is this is where all of that roundabout routing starts to come together. 
After I progress in Sylph and ultimately beat Giovanni number two, I'm gonna hit level 40. And this is where I'm gonna choose to pop the last five rare candies of the run. Now this is gonna give me a huge power boost just in terms of levels and stats. But more importantly, this gets me access to Shadow Claw. Now as I mentioned earlier, it gets stabbed, guaranteed to crit, and you can see already that it's at 199 base power. So it's a nuke that's gonna kinda ease Garatina through the rest of the game with a lot of power. And you can see why earlier I was so tempted by the legend Arceus learn set to get this at level 19 but like I already touched on there's just so many normal top Pokemon during that part of the game that you just don't have a great answer to but that's kind of hypothetical we got it now let's make immediate use of it and it goes without saying that Shadow Claw is going to absolutely rip Sabrina to shreds. And what's nice about it is that it gives me a guaranteed one shot on Venomoth, which I didn't have before. And it pretty much makes this one like a brain dead battle that you can't possibly lose. And that's going to take us to the final gym. I can summarize this one with two words, Ice Beam. I just spam it until the battle's over, and since I wasn't gonna talk about it anyway, Shadow Claw also gives me guaranteed ranges on the mandatory Black Belt in Giovanni's Gym, and that's only relevant because not even Dialga or Palkia had guaranteed one-shots there, but in a fairly good quick time, that's already the badge portion of the game over with. I'm gonna hop directly into rival number six and it's a demolition. I have my pick of super effective damage on Pidgeot and from there I don't even have to take my finger off the trigger of Shadow Claw and I can pretty much just cruise to the rest of the fight. Now it's not the fastest battle in the world because Alakazam outspeeds me and Blastoise can take a hit but Garatina looks pretty good at this point in the game but let's get back to the overworld because there are a few points I would like to go over heading into that end game. First, let's take a final look at split data. And you know I always do the third gym and the final gym because the middle tends to get weird with different routing. But one thing is very clear, Dialga is seemingly a little too much to overcome for Garatina. By the time we made it to Giovanni, that one minute and 10 second surge deficit goes all the way up to two minutes and 34 seconds. And you might be looking at this and saying, hey, the Elite Four starts time, pretty good. You cut that lead down. So you might be thinking, hey, Shadow Claw might make a big difference here. But the time I gained in those splits was because I used my candies a lot earlier than Dialga. That's where most of that time comes from. But for all intents and purposes, it just looks like Garatina will fall just a little bit short outside of like an immaculate Elite Four run. Earlier, I did also mention three things on paper that made Garatina seem worse, and I talked about the lower special making it miss ranges, but now we can finally talk about the other two. Dialga and Palkia's typing had one big thing in common. It negated the ice weakness you have against Lorelei, and while Ghost and Dragon is really good, top tier, you're still weak to ice, and it makes that fight a little bit harder to prepare for and navigate, whereas the other two didn't even have to think about it. The final reason is the signature move, Roar of time was great it had that big risk reward type of move and it felt good to use it was really powerful and palkia had spatial rin and that pushed palkia to another level into the top three but garatina's signature move without sugarcoating it it's bad for multiple reasons if you just look at the effective power it's a 180 power ghost move with stab and you can already see if you look down that shadow claw is stronger than it but it gets a little bit worse than that it's a two turn move like fly or dig meaning essentially it's a meager 90 effective power per turn. It just doesn't have the raw power, it takes two turns, it doesn't have any other effects, and to top it all off, Ghost is a physical typing in Gen 1, which is inferior to the other two special damage from the dragon typing. Now I did put it in the ROM if any of you are gonna play this for yourself, but Shadow Claw is just pound for pound better in every conceivable way, but at the end of the day, it was the signature moves for the other runs that catapulted them into the number three and four spot, and Garatina just doesn't have that. Now the problematic part overall is that these runs have gotten so good that I'm pretty much forced to get through this game at as low level as I can just to be able to compete and that's going to leave us with a level 48 elite four start and I think it's about time we just get to it. Initially, I was really worried about Lorelei when I started chopping off levels, but don't forget one thing, Garatina is an absolute tank. It has 150 base HP, 120 special, and it makes this actually not that bad. And what's cool about Garatina is that the attack drop from Aurora Beam is actually welcome because it's gonna badge boost you, and Shadow Claw is gonna ignore the stat drop anyway, so it doesn't affect you at all. Now, Lapras is the only Pokemon that can be scary, but being Ghost-type means that it can go for Blizzard, but also Confuse Ray. 
You can tank one blizzard just fine like you see here, but even though I get through this one on the very first try, it was still pretty close. It's definitely not a guaranteed fight. Bruno, Hiker Anthony, whatever he's calling himself this week, it's about the same as always. I just spam Ice Beam for a lot of the fight. I swap over to Shadow Claw. That's pretty much my analysis here. I'm ready to move on. On Agatha, this is the very last spot where the Carbos really helps you. It lets me outspeed the first Gengar and have a relatively fast path to the fight. There are two tricky things about this run in particular that made it risky, and most of that is that I didn't heal, just because I wanted to see if I could save a little bit of time. Now you really can't one shot the Golbat, but it's not much of a threat, but where it comes down to a classic coin flip is at the end because you don't outspeed the final Gengar, and you already know Nightshade would have taken me out here, but even though it gets a little bit scary with that confusion Ray, I do shrug it off, I hit the Shadow Claw, and we're already ready to move on to the next one. You guys already know about Lance. When you have Thunderbolt, you have Ice Beam, it's just a free fight. I don't outspeed Aerodactyl, but in red version, it only has normal moves. It can't damage us anyway. And the only thing that I would like to call attention to in this fight is the new color palette for Dragonite. And I'm just gonna say it. I think it looks stupid with a brown palette in the vanilla game. And for me, I think this might be my favorite recolor of all the crystal sprites that I've done. But enough of that, this one's over. We have one final battle left. Here's where you're going to start to lose a bunch of turns, but I'm not too bothered by it because if you think about it, getting two or three extra levels just to save a few turns is going to be a net loss in the long run. But it does mean that Pidgeot can survive a turn, Alakazam's going to outspeed me, get in a move, and then even things like Arcanine's going to survive, slowing things down just a little bit. But I think it's all worth it in the end just to see a super effective 400 power Shadow Claw send Executor to the Shadow Rim. That's what I love to see. It makes the entire run, all my time spent worth it just seeing that right there. On the Blast Toys, I do have the damage and it's all but a formality, but I think the Hydro Pump animation, it's just so long here. I think this is something I can pin point costing Garatina a sub one hour 51 minute time but I'm sure you could probably look back and find a million things but that's going to be the run over. Garatina finishes with a final time of 1 hour, 51 minutes and 7 seconds, meaning it's a little over 2 minutes behind Dialga and about 4 minutes behind Palkia. Now overall it puts Garatina in 8th place which isn't too shabby and I had a lot of fun with this one. My process of doing runs means that I'm never biased about a Pokemon, but this, now that everything's over, Garatina is one of my favorite Pokemon. I also think the shiny form is up there too which is why I went with it just because it's fun. And I think if I just take a look back and kind of take a retrospective on things, it went about how I expected. I think if the Legends Arceus learn set gave it something decent early like Dragon Breath or Dragon Rage early and gave us like a smooth transition to level 19 for that early Shadow Claw, things could have gone a little different. But remember one key thing, I don't just make up learn sets for these runs and I'm sorry in advance for the people that have told me to like, hey do an Arceus run with level 1 judgment and give it the Legend plate. I think it could be Mega Mewtwo wise time. And all I gotta say is buddy, that's just, that's not gonna work for me. Outside of like one exception, I don't think Arceus learns judgment until like level 100 and I think if you take it further and simulate a held item for one Pokemon and start to play favorites it sort of undermines this fun little experiment these little cross-gen runs that I got going on but as always I'm interested to see how it turns out and see what you guys think about all that kind of stuff but I think that's gonna do it for me special shout out to my channel members and patreons to support on a small channel I can't say this enough it helps a ton and if you made it this far in the video you are a real one I do appreciate it a lot and now I think I got some some coding things that I need to clean up before I get to another Gen 2 and Gen 3 run, but I think I'll catch you guys on the next one. Have a great Halloween. Bye.